This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that exposes the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data sourced from the dark web that power solutions that proactively protect over 3 billion employees and consumer accounts worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Uber suffers a data breach. Social media executives testify before Congress. A large DDoS attack is thwarted in Eastern Europe. The FBI warns of increased cyber attacks against healthcare payment processors. Policymakers consider new OT security incentives. Malek Ben Salem from Accenture on future proof cloud security. Our guest is Diana Kelly from CyberEyes to discuss the need for innovation and entrepreneurship in cybersecurity. And if you've been hoping for a locker go ga decryptor, you're in luck. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, September 16th, 2022. Uber is investigating a breach of its systems, the New York Times reports. Yesterday, the company said in a tweet, We are currently responding to a cybersecurity incident. We are in touch with law enforcement and will post additional updates here as they become available. The Times reports that the breach looks to have compromised a multitude of Uber's systems, with the hacker sending the Times images of email, cloud storage, and code repositories. Sam Curry, a security engineer at Yuga Labs who was in contact with the hacker, says... They pretty much have full access to Uber. This is a total compromise from what it looks like. The threat actor reportedly compromised a worker's account on the company's internal messaging service, Slack, saying, I announce I am a hacker and Uber has suffered a data breach. Two employees who weren't authorized to speak on the situation publicly have said that they were told not to use Slack and that other internal systems were inaccessible. The breach utilized phishing and social engineering through sending a text to a worker convincing them to send a password that would gain the hacker access. An Uber spokesperson says that the breach is under investigation by the company and that law enforcement officials are being contacted. Once again, we see that there's no honor among thieves. Digital Shadows reports an interesting example of faithlessness in the criminal-to-criminal marketplace. Two admins working in a carding ring in the Alternet forum scammed their prospective affiliates with an address baited to induce the marks to feed cryptocurrency into wallets the scammers of thieves themselves controlled. May they all get caught. May both sides lose. Social media executives from Meta, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube testified before the Senate Homeland Security Committee, TechCrunch reports, and apparently they didn't overshare. The hearing, intended to dive into the impact social media has on national security, took place on Wednesday, covering topics ranging from domestic extremism and misinformation to connections with China. The testimony was, as it so often is before a Senate committee, guarded. When asked by committee chair Senator Gary Peters to disclose the number of employees working full-time on trust and safety, The only answer offered was by Twitter General Manager of Consumer and Revenue Jay Sullivan, who said 2,200 people were working on trust and safety across Twitter, but it is unclear if all those employees worked only on trust and safety. Senator Alex Padilla asked Meta Executive Chris Cox, In your testimony, you state that you have over 40,000 people working on trust and safety issues. How many of those people focus on non-English language content and how many of them focus on non-U.S. users. 
The senator didn't answer. The question was then directed to the other executives, who also didn't offer an answer. When TikTok COO Vanessa Pappas was asked about the social media giant's connections with China, specifically where Chinese-based parent company of TikTok ByteDance is based, she fumbled, answering the question by saying that the company is distributed and doesn't have a headquarters at all. Slate reports that Senator John Ossoff said to Pappas when talking about Chinese connections, I'm going to humbly and respectfully ask you not to give me the top-line talking points. Pappas also denied reports that the parent company's employees were regularly accessing private data on U.S. users of the app, despite leaked audio saying otherwise. Cyber6 Gill reports that Russian operators in the dark web are turning their skills at handling contraband to exploitation of the shortages international sanctions have induced in Russia. While it doesn't work for perishables like McDonald's cheeseburgers, it works just fine for durable goods, particularly consumer IT hardware. Cyber6 Gill says, Our research has found that Russian actors are using the dark web to circumvent sanctions, enabling them to transfer funds and purchase goods from beyond Russia's borders. Thus, while Russians can no longer enjoy a meal at McDonald's or a coffee at Starbucks, savvy users of the underground can still get their hands on technology products produced by Apple, AMD, Intel, Microsoft, or NVIDIA, even though they suspended sales in Russia and Belarus. Their skills have also proved well adapted to getting around bans on purchases major bank cards have imposed, stating, And despite the fact that Visa, MasterCard, and American Express prohibit Russian cardholders from purchasing items outside of Russia, actors on underground forums can procure cryptocurrency or virtual and prepaid credit cards in order to make purchases abroad. Akamai says that it stopped a record-setting distributed denial-of-service attack against an unnamed Eastern European customer this week, stating, On Monday, September 12, 2022, Akamai successfully detected and mitigated the now-largest DDoS attack ever launched against a European customer on the Prolexic platform, with attack traffic abruptly spiking to 748 megapackets per second in an aggressive attempt to cripple the organization's business operations. The attacker's command and control was unusually supple. Akamai offers no attribution, but the target selection and the choice of DDoS as an attack technique are suggestive of recent Russian offensive activity. The FBI reports that they've observed an increase in cybercriminal attacks against healthcare payment processors, redirecting victims' payments. Threat actors rely on personally identifiable information that is public, along with social engineering, to impersonate the victims and gain access to files, healthcare portals, payment information, and websites, going so far as even changing direct deposit information to the attacker's own. Security Week says that in February 2022, $3.1 million was redirected after the direct deposit information was changed. The same thing happened again, and the actor stole $700,000. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency has released 11 industrial control systems advisories. In addition to these advisories, CISA has also added six new entries to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. Federal civilian executive agencies falling under CISA's remit have until October 6, 2022, to take action to identify and mitigate them. Policymakers and federal agencies are considering new incentives for operational technology security in hopes of getting critical infrastructure companies to prioritize cybersecurity and replace old technologies, SC Media reports. The House Homeland Security Committee held a hearing on the topic Thursday. Representative Yvette Clark, chair of the House Homeland Security Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection and Innovation, said that focusing on IT systems at the cost of OT systems is simply not an option in today's threat landscape, as OT becomes more Internet-connected, integrating with IT systems and attractive to our adversaries. Many OT systems are outdated, running either old software or unpatched software, which allows for hackers to easily target the systems, 
as even the most minor change can cause significant disruptions to necessary services. Michael Dransfield, a senior technical executive for Control Systems Cybersecurity at the NSA, highlighted the increasing age in workers familiar with OT security, which has caused many companies to transition to vulnerable, automated systems. After the break, our guest Diana Kelly from Cybrise discusses the need for innovation and entrepreneurship in cybersecurity, and Malek Ben Salem from Accenture on future proof cloud security. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Dragos. Asset visibility is the foundation of an effective operational technology cybersecurity strategy. Many core cybersecurity program pillars depend on having rich and complete asset visibility with intelligence-driven context. Dragos has a white paper which provides 10 distinct ways that asset visibility helps inform a broader strategy for OT visibility, including discovering, classifying, and verifying ICS and OT assets, network connectivity and communication signaling potential threats, providing key information for incident response, minimizing the impact of compliance reporting, and justifying security investments and roadmap planning. To download, go to dragos.com slash 10 dash ways. That's dragos.com slash the number 10 dash ways. And we thank Dragos for sponsoring our show. And now, a word from our sponsor, Axonius. Too many cybersecurity assets and SaaS apps, not enough visibility. Enter Axonius. The Axonius solution correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up to date inventory, uncover gaps, and automate action, giving IT and security teams the confidence to control complexity. Visit axonius.com slash cyberwire to learn more and try it free. That's A-X-O-N-I-U-S dot com slash Cyberwire. And we thank Axonius for sponsoring our show. Diana Kelly is CSO and co-founder of security workforce development company Cyberize, and she also is one of the judges of the upcoming Data Tribe Challenge, where startup hopefuls compete for up to $2 million in funding. The CyberWire is a media partner with Data Tribe. Here's my conversation with Diana Kelly. Yeah, I think it's a really incredible time in, in cyber right now in terms of innovation because there have been a lot of advances in technology that have now enabled us to create and to come up with, just ideate really new ways to use that technology. So what do I mean specifically? The cloud. We've talked about digital transformation and we're all going to be both the cloud and now we're here. We are in the cloud. Organizations take a huge advantage of all that's offering, all the offerings in the cloud. And that means that security now can take that step of, we don't always have to sit on premise. We can now go into the cloud, go into multiple clouds, get that signal, that information, the economies of security scale, if I like to call it. So then that's really just driving a lot of, of innovation and adoption. We've also seen other advances that are helping in terms of things like the technology is we just have faster computers. We have more compute power that's available to all of us. We have always on, which is not something that has been, you know, a reality. Even now you can be on Wi-Fi on the plane, like it or not, <laughs> but you can, <laughs> you can literally work anywhere, anytime. So it's a really great time right now in security. And the other thing that's driving the innovation is this inter, this, you know, forcing factor of we need to be able to manage not just our own organizations, but also our entire system, right? Our ecosystem, which includes our partners and consultants and vendors that we work with. And that means that there's this real big drive for automation because we just can't do all of this, by, you know, manually. What does that mean for the folks who are out there looking to innovate, for those hopeful people who you think they have an idea that that may change the world and 
you know, are looking to just get the word out and, and tell people about their ideas? Well, there's a lot of, of uh, I don't want to say noise. That's, I just said it though. Uh, but there, there are a lot of voices who are competing for attention. And you've got some voices that are very loud because they've been here for a long time. And they're, they're very, you know, they've been contributing to security and have a, you know, a, a fairly big megaphone. So as new or innovative companies, you need to find a way to have your voice kind of vibrate at the right, uh, the right level so that you can be heard above some of this, uh, you know, conversation that's going on, an important conversation that's going on. So it's really about differentiating. It doesn't need, need to be a blue ocean anymore. Yeah. If you remember that book where, you know, try to find the blue ocean. Um, you don't need to find a pure blue ocean, but do understand what may have gone wrong if the ocean's already red. And what I mean by that is that you look at, um, we seem to sort of improve and optimize in this cyclical way in security. So SIM, Security Event Information Managers, were introduced to the market a little over 20 years ago. And over time, we've seen next generation SIMs come out that are smarter, easier to use, cloud aware or functioning in the cloud. Uh, very importantly, are using things like machine learning to be better about, and about the information and their analysis and the alerts that they're sending. So it doesn't have to be a space no one's been in before. There's a lot of next generation optimization that's going on in, exi in existing tool categories. And then there are also new and emerging tool categories to keep up with the pace of technology. You're going to be participating in the upcoming Data Tribe Challenge. Uh, why is this something that you, you feel as though uh, is worth your time, that, that you want to contribute to? Because, it, it, again, it's very hard to get your voice heard if you're a new, exciting idea, but there isn't a market space or a niche for it yet, and you just haven't gotten the funding. So I really love that Data Tribe is doing this, where you know, three finalists are going to split the $20,000, but then... There's an up to $2 million in seed capital that's available uh, potentially for the winner. And I think that, you know, it, it can be very hard to get an idea off the ground. And I love that Data Tribe is going out saying, let's just let everybody come in. In VC, sometimes it can be as in anything in life. So it can be a little bit of a, a who you know. And in this case, it's not a who you know at all. It's open to everyone. That's why we've got a, a judging panel to look at the, at what's submitted. So I, I just love that it's this very open democratic process to help give funding and support to these ideas that may not have been heard yet. What's your advice uh, to that hopeful startup for, for someone who's out there trying to get noticed? Any words of wisdom? Define the problem. You know, founders can decide there's a problem, but they don't really understand that. So define the problem very, very clearly and make sure that you've researched it and that you actually have a solution that is a problem and not just a solution that's looking for a problem. So be very clear on tying those together and focus the message. It's not uncommon with founders. You kind of want to solve everything and do everything. And very often when you go out and you start talking to investors or potential buyers, they'll say, but what about this? And what about that? Got to stay laser focused in your message. So laser focused as you explain what your solution is to the judging panel. And then the other thing that's that's really important is to make sure that you differentiate it. Understand who the competitors are. You've got a problem. You're very focused, but also who else is solving that problem and why do you do it better? That's Diana Kelly from Cyberize. You can find out more about the upcoming Data Tribe Challenge on their website, datatribe.com. There's a lot more to this conversation. If you want to hear more, head on over to the CyberWire Pro and sign up for Interview Selects, where you'll get access to this and many more extended interviews.
And it is always my pleasure to welcome back to the show Malek Ben Salem. She is the Security Innovation Principal Director at Accenture Security. Uh, Malek, welcome back. Uh, I want to touch base with you today on some stuff I know you and your colleagues have had your eye on, and that's machine language security and safety. What can you share with us today? Yeah, I think this is a problem that, uh, or an area of security that does not get enough attention, which is why I'd like to talk about it again on this podcast. Um, as you know, you know, AI and uh, powered by machine learning is, is being deployed in high stakes environments, right? And in medical devices and medical settings and uh, for autonomous driving. So these are environments that are obviously high stake, um, that um, include some safety uh, aspects, you know, with the AI interacting with a physical environment or has uh, w- where it may have an impact on the safety of the individual in this sur- and or and or the people in the surroundings. Um, So it needs to uh, be built in a secure and safe manner. The other aspect or factor that makes it difficult to build AI that is secure and safe is, you know, the lack of modularity or encapsulation when building these AI-powered systems. Hmm. So unlike, you know... Traditional applications, we're familiar with how we write code. You know, there are, uh, you know, say object-oriented code where everything is, uh, we have abstraction principles, we have modularity principles. That's that's not valid for um, machine learning models, right? Or these neural network architectures. Hmm. So that makes them very complex, uh, very hard to understand, right, for for humans, and it makes it hard to know uh, what output can we expect by giving these AI systems certain inputs. Hmm. Yeah, help me understand here. I mean, is it, to what degree are they kind of black boxes where you, you, you put stuff in and, you know, quite often it could be a, to your surprise, delight, or horror what comes out the other side? To a very uh, high degree, I would say, uh, yeah. which is why there are certain uh, research communities working on explainability for these systems uh, or for these machine learning models. So developing certain techniques to make them more explain- explainable. Uh, obviously, that is important, but uh, that in and of itself has its own security implications because the more you explain, the more transparent you make these models, the more uh, they become vulnerable as well to adversaries because now they know how they are working. They know the inner workings of these models and uh, that may help them attack them even easier uh, hmm. in an easier fashion. So it, it's really a trade-off. Yeah, we, we need to make them explainable for the developers uh, so that they're able to make them more robust, uh, but not necessarily expose uh, expose them or make them transparent to um, to adversaries and and threat actors. And are there any standards for dialing that in? I mean, are are there frameworks that have been adopted? Um, yeah, that that's the big challenge, right? <laughs> I think mm. uh, I think we have different communities working on making these. Uh, machine learning models more robust, um, but we don't have, you know, widely adopted frameworks, or at least the frameworks that we have may be lacking. When I talk about robustness, I, you know, there's there's two aspects of robustness, right? There's there's the aspect of making these machine learning models um, be able to um, work in an in an environment. Uh, where they see an or overcome an unusual event, mm-hmm. right? That's one form of robustness. And the other aspect of robustness is being robust to adversarial uh, attacks. So that's that's another aspect. And sometimes these two goals may not go hand in hand, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you build your model to be able to react in, in certain events. And let me give an example 
you know, let's say, let's say you're building a uh, an autopilot on a self-driving car. It's supposed to recognize uh, stop signs, right? Um, and when it recognizes a stop sign, it's supposed to stop. But what happens if uh, if that stop sign is shows up in a um, say a traffic bar, <laughs> right? That is uh, like on, on a parking entry, right? And that bar is risen. You, you're not necessarily supposed to stop at that point. Or mm. what if somebody is wearing a t-shirt with a stop sign? Mm-hmm. That car stopping at that point may be a, may be a hazard, right? Uh, so recognizing those unusual events and, and having the autopilot system respond to them in a proper manner um, is a challenge, but as I mentioned, the, the adversarial case as well is, is important to recognize. So what if, what if a, pass and a passerby wears that uh, T-shirt advertently, right, in order mm-hmm. to um, create some chaos? So again, it, it, you know, the problem is not, is not easy to solve. There are, there are certain defenses that I can talk to um, or proposed Uh, ways of responding uh, or mitigating this problem, Uh, but I think they do require uh, definitely more research and and more attention uh, by uh, ML engineers. Yeah. All right. Well, interesting stuff. Malek Ben Salem, thanks for joining us. We want to thank our sponsor, Keeper Security, for helping make this episode possible. Keeper is the world's most secure password manager for organizations. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Sam Crowther from Casada. We're discussing their work, The New Way Fraudsters Bypass Bot Management. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Liz Irvin, Rachel Gelfand, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Now, a word from our sponsor, Alert Logic. The defining characteristic of a managed detection and response service is its focus on delivering a meaningful security outcome, meant to ease both pre breach and post breach concerns. Maximum visibility and the ability to detect and respond to threats combines with capabilities to minimize the impact of vulnerabilities, configuration issues, and attacks. An effective MDR solution must address both. Alert Logic is the only MDR provider that delivers comprehensive coverage for public clouds, SaaS, on premises, and hybrid environments. Their cloud native technology and white glove team of security experts protect your organization 24 7 and ensure you have the most effective response to resolve whatever threats may come. Alert Logic is the industry's first SaaS MDR provider with purpose built technology and security experts that help identify and respond to cybersecurity breaches, providing complete compliance solutions that give customers peace of mind and deliver on best practices. Learn more about how Alert Logic's MDR can provide complete coverage for your most critical assets at alertlogic.com. That's alertlogic.com. And we thank Alert Logic for sponsoring our show. 